Hey, everybody. June 2023, Economic Insights with Marcy Russell. Marcy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's good to be here coming to you today from Washington, D.C., on the road in a very not so fancy hotel room, as you can see behind me. It's not very glamorous. Marcy, thank you again for taking time out of your amazingly busy world and, and schedule and travel and jet setting and glamorous hotel rooms uh, to be with us today. We have um, a huge crowd today. Guys, uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time, one of the wonderful things about these sessions is uh, Q&A, uh, which Marcy will take at the end for as much time as we have. Um, the other item here that is a hot, hot topic uh, in the uh, offerings that Leading RE is putting out for you guys is our webinar week coming up. Uh, hopefully you can all see the screen right now. That uh, link to register is at the top. We have over the course of the week of July 10th through the 14th, 26 sessions for you guys. Now this is to be treated as buffet style or else nobody's gonna get anything done other than a huge amount of learning, but we have something for everybody. Agents, there is a ton of uh, sessions for increasing your bottom line, listings, uh, uh, pipeline, all the rest of it. Leadership, we have wonderful sessions for you guys. Um, we've got a very powerful uh, DEI session. Lennox Scott is going to be moderating that. Um, there's just, there's so much going on. And my, one of my favorite sessions that I'm looking forward to is a Friday session with Marcy Russell. This is in addition to the July web, uh, the July Economic Insights, which will be happening the following week. This is going to be a vision session. Um, Marcy is going to be looking down the road uh, at the next 10 years and really breaking down her thoughts and predictions on what is going to be happening over the next decade. So it's going to be one for the books. Marcy, thank you again for doing that for us as well. Okay, so with all of that, register for those sessions that you want. Uh, if you register and can't show up, I know we've got a lot of global folks on the call uh, this morning, you will get those recordings in your inbox. So go ahead and register, sleep through it, uh, and then it'll, it'll be waiting for you in the morning. Okay, we have so much to talk about going on right now. First of all, let's start with one of the biggest topics right now, which obviously is inflation and the Fed response to this. Um, you called out this morning uh, a fantastic quote from Powell uh, on that point. You want, you want to start with that? Sure. Well, Jerome Powell gave testimony to Congress. He, he sort of goes up to Capitol Hill um, twice a year and sits before our elected representatives and is required by law to make a report to them basically around monetary policy, financial market conditions, all the things that the sort of the Fed, Federal Reserve does. And when he was discussing inflation and the likely path of interest rates over the course of the next six months, because of course, our legislators are very interested in that, and, and so was I. And he basically said monetary policy is at the point where we're really in a slowing down phase and attempting to reach our destination in a certain way. And he said one of the reasons they're slowing down is imagine um, you're attempting to go to a destination. And when you take off um, and you're on the highway, you go at 75 miles an hour. And then you get into the city and things are a little more dense and you slow down to 50 miles an hour. But as you get close to your destination, you really can slow down a lot right before you get there. And so I really thought that metaphor was super helpful in thinking about monetary policy over the last 18 months. When they got started, raising rates, tightening policy, they drove at 75 miles an hour, it was very quick. Um, they then got to the point where they realized they are getting closer to their destination, which of course is a 2% um, target rate on inflation. Measures of inflation right now currently are at 4%, which means we've gone from almost 10% inflation at the a year ago, basically, to 4% today. So that's a remarkable sort of drawing near to their destination of 2%, but they are not there yet. So he made a lot of discussion and there's been a lot of talk about how everyone on the FOMC committee, all the voting members are saying we would be comfortable raising rates again after this pause. But I got to tell you, my friends, I'm really not anticipating that. If inflation continues to come down the way that it has been and hits that 2% target by the end of the year, 
I think that they've done a lot and they're already at five, a little over 5% on the Fed funds target rate. We know that it is causing stress in financial markets. We know that the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy have indeed slowed down, real estate being one of them, commercial real estate being the other, technology being the other. So this sort of lag in monetary policy is definitely hitting the economy right now, but their credibility is on the line. And so they can't go up before the public and say, you know what, we think we're done because that would actually be the worst mistake, right? The worst mistake would be saying we're done and then having to come back and say, oh, actually we're not. So they are essentially sort of hedging their bets, um, taking the position of, hey, 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 don't think we're done yet. Don't think we're done yet. Um, because the worst thing that could happen is they say they're done and then they have to come back and raise rates again. So they're kind of talking a talk that we're not accustomed to, but they're signaling to markets that we are still on the case, but we are taking a pause. All right, let's stick in Washington for another second here. We watched for the last few months with bated breath, this sort of dramatic soap opera play out in DC around the debt ceiling, right? Last month, finally, um, Congress was able to hammer out a deal across the aisle. Awesome, right? Can you talk though a little bit about what that deal was and what the implications are for what actually was contained in that package? Sure. Well, I think there are three meaningful things to take away from the debt ceiling sort of negotiations that eventually resulted in, number one, a somewhat bipartisan solution to raising the debt ceiling. Um, I got to tell you, Jess, I think for anyone who has been hoping to see Congress return to the days when they actually could function and could make a deal, um, the fact that they did that, you know, the optimist in me, I'm going to take that as good news, right? So it kind of looked a little bit like the old fashioned politics from the 90s and early 2000s um, that were contentious enough for everyone to feel like they got something out of it, um, but at the same time allowed us to move on to the next step. So that's the first thing. I'm going to sort of go with the positive first. Um, the second thing, though, um, was that they did indeed kind of kick the can down to after the next election. So in some ways, I think, again, that was a move to at least maybe remove some of the contentious, um, poisonous uh, partisanship out of the discussion by saying, look, we're just going to get this to the net selection. And once again, you know, let constituents have their voice heard and sort of their expression of what they actually want to happen. Because, you know, when you actually looked at polling data, every sort of overwhelmingly, the American public said, we're willing to accept some cuts um, as long as you guys get a deal done. What we don't want is this brinkmanship that introduces instability in the financial markets, right? And so in sort of moving the negotiations further down the line, at least they took that off the table. The most meaningful economic aspect of their deal, I believe, was that they required um, student loan repayments to begin at the end of the summer. Um, this is something that, um, from my sort of a point of view, purely as an economist, um, the conditions that were prevalent during COVID-19, the unemployment, the uncertainty that might have made a pause on student loan repayments make sense in 2020. Maybe it made sense into 2021 if you sort of targeted um, folks who really had lost their jobs in the hospitality sector, the travel sector, um, the restaurant industry. But my friends, it is 2023. There is no recession. The unemployment rate is 3.7 percent. So there's no way to sort of make the argument that the economic conditions today are the emergency situation that would require you to put a pause on student loan repayments. It was time to get them restarted. They should have restarted a year ago, but okay, fine. That's just my own personal little soapbox, not partisan, economic. That being said, the re the beginning to sort of student loan payments sort of beginning to happen again, I believe is going to be a deflationary um, development. Right. So we're looking to bring inflation down. We know that half of the inflation was caused by supply chain disruptions. 
The other half of the inflation was caused by a surge in demand from income support. And the pause in student loan repayments was part of that. And so pulling back that last little bit of demand surge by requiring student loan payments to begin again is going to be deflationary as the year goes on, as folks repay those loans, as opposed to, you know, spending that money on, you know, discretionary spending, so to speak. So those are really the three most um, economically you know, important things from the deal. There was a little spending cut here, some work requirements there, but all that stuff was really around the edges. Um, in terms of real economic impact over the next year, I do think those student loan repayments are really going to be the place where you see it have a meaningful impact. Let's dive a little bit more in a minute into the bigger picture on recession questions, on housing bust questions, cliffs are being talked about, etc. In the meantime, though, let's really Let's really kind of take a take a look at what the housing market is doing right now, which unfortunately isn't much, right? There's there's some stagnation going on, and the inventory talk is just incessant, right? May numbers, there's around half as many homes on the market as there were in 2019, which is kind of 2019 is our litmus test for normalcy at this point. Uh, mortgage rates still over seven percent, despite home values being really high, I think, you know, homeowners are kind of cuddled up with their super low interest rates and aren't moving. Buyers are freaked out. Break this down for us, Marcy. Um, is there going to be some more movement here in the second half of the year? Sure. Well, in terms of, you know, the price interest rate sort of relationship, number one, um, I don't believe anyone expects the current interest rate environment to be permanent, right? We know that the Federal Reserve will eventually begin to lower rates and that will bring interest rates down for mortgages, right? So this 7% mortgage rate, if it were going to last forever, it wouldn't have an impact on people's decisions. They would basically just say, you know what? I need a house, I need it now, and I'll pay the 7% and just move on. Um, the world has lived through 7% mortgage rates before. Sure. That was where they were prevalent in the late 1990s, in the um, so 7% mortgage rates is not a deal killer for markets. However, it will make people pause and not do anything if they believe rates are going to go down in the future, right? So the 7% mortgage rate, while on the surface is no big deal, it happens to do with the temporary nature of it that's sort of distorting markets, right? Um, on the other side of things, we know that if you do have right a mortgage rate at less than 4%, you don't want to let go of that in a 7% environment. So you get this deep freeze, right? That's the way I've described it. We've been sort of in a housing market deep freeze, and it's been that way for a year. It doesn't last forever for a couple of reasons. Eventually, people will have to move for all the reasons that they moved before. Their families get bigger. They need different houses. Now, the one thing that used to cause people to move and isn't doing so much more um, is relocation for a job, right? We know that with the development of remote working, essentially that thing that sort of pushed people out of their homes and forced them to make a decision for many folks is no longer on the table. So this is another sort of aspect of all this that's sort of playing into a housing market that looks like one many of us have never seen before but we do know a couple of things. There's quite a bit of building going on right now that even though current conditions, right, are, are very, very tight, we also know that there's a lot of building going on, a lot of inventory coming online, not just in single family homes, but also in the apartment market. So we know that there are about 500,000 new apartment units that are coming online this year. And a rental apartment is a substitute for a home right? A home that you own. And so if more inventory comes on there, it will definitely loosen conditions in the residential sort of single family home market. But in terms of prices going down, there are a lot of folks out there, and, and we talked about this before, buyers are thinking that it's 2009 and sellers are thinking that it's 2021. And somehow the expectations of those two groups have to come together particularly when it comes to buyers who are somehow waiting and thinking, oh my gosh, if I just wait, I'm going to get this great deal. The only thing that causes home prices to decline is distressed selling, right? Like we saw in 2008, 2009, and 2010. 
You got to have distressed sellers who just finally are throw in the towel, sell the house, do whatever it takes. We are nowhere near anything like that, Jess. There's just no distress on the seller side. So if you're sort of got buyers who are going, you know what, I'm just going to wait this out. I'm going to get a great deal in a year. You're not. That's just not what's going to happen. Yeah. No. And that's the conversation to be having with them, right? Like, stop sitting on your decisions, stop right? Sitting. Stop sitting. Stop sitting. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's let's talk for a minute about that construction ecosystem, right? Because that's something that has been there. Starts happening. Um, there is still. Uh, I, I've heard recently some concerns about certain supply chain elements, not the big picture, but in particular concrete. Um, what are your thoughts on where we're going to be with you know these starts actually being able to turn into dwellings that people can be in? Sure. Well, I got to tell you, I am here in the D.C. area and um, I actually have an aunt who lives out here. Right. And so I was visiting with her just the other day. and She's been in D.C. for 40 years. Right. She's from Arkansas, just like my family. And she moved up here to D.C. and um, has been a keen observer of the D.C. suburbs for a really long time. And she said, my husband and I were out driving around just the other day. And she goes, we stumbled upon this neighborhood and they're building two thousand new homes in this area that used to be woods and it is got its own restaurants and stores and all this kind of stuff she goes there were houses everywhere starting at a million dollars a piece just so you know right um but but thousands of homes being built the cranes are everywhere and yeah i understand that there's always going to be a headline about some element of construction being expensive because that's what happens to commodities. If it's not the price of wood, then it's the price of um, cement. If it's not the price of cement, then it's the price of rebar, you know, it's steel, all that stuff. There's always some commodity around housing that's experiencing some kind of price hike, price spike across the board. But when I take a step back and I look at supply chain pressures more broadly, the ones that really were disrupting home building in 2021 and 2022. I've cited this to folks over and over again. It's a statistic I look at very closely. The New York Federal Reserve puts out an index of supply chain pressures, and you can see how disrupted supply chains are in general, not just for one or two things, because you can deal with those. Those don't shut construction down completely. Now, that index returned to its normal levels in December of last year. So it all takes a little time, but essentially the supply chain around most things is back to normal. Um, it's one of the reasons why we've seen inflation come down so dramatically, sort of began tying it back to this bigger picture that half the inflation was supply chain disruption, half was demand. So you're seeing that return to normal. Um, and I think it, the return to paying student loans and China's re-entry into the global economy, but not at the frenetic level everyone was expecting, right. again, is kind of good news for the supply chain. You know, had the Chinese economy come back the way the US economy came back, we'd be in for another 2021, 2022. But all those headlines around, you know, disappointing Chinese recovery. Honestly, my friends, it has not been disappointing to me because it's not going to be inflationary the way the U.S. recovery was inflationary. Before we move into your predictions on recession uh, for the last half of the year, let's talk a little bit about about commercial here for a second, because there are some ugly patches uh, happening around the country in commercial. What are what are your thoughts? Sure. Um, commercial has been the one area that we talked over and over and over again that I have sort of maintained will be a very slow moving, difficult. Um, I don't want to call it crisis because crisis implies something that happens in usually a really short period of time. This is going to drag on perhaps for a decade, because what we know is that in many large cities around the U.S., you have seen a permanent change in the way that people work and play. And I don't care what mayors say, you are not going to get people to come back into the office to the same degree that they did prior to 2020. 
I don't care what Elon Musk says. I don't care what the mayor of San Francisco and New York says they want to do. Workers are in the driver's seat now because they're in such short supply, right? So we know that anything that's not a trophy property, anything that is class B, class C office space is going to have to be restructured, right? Or repurposed. The deals are going to get restructured. The deals are going to get repurposed. Now on the repurposing side in the cities that are being hit the hardest, New York and San Francisco, they're also the cities with the greatest residential housing shortage. Now it's going to require public private money to transform those buildings into residential facilities, right? I mean, there's just no question about it. It's not going to be easy, but at the same time, you also have a very well-developed industry around restructuring these big deals, right? So restructuring bad residential or bad commercial real estate is an entire industry in and of itself. And it usually kicks into gear every 15 or 20 years. So there's some attorneys out there who are gearing up for some really good years um, in this distressed debt sector. But it's different than the kind of macroeconomic catastrophe that occurs when millions of private homeowners are in distress, right? So a bunch of, you know, a handful of big commercial real estate sort of deals in distress is very different than millions of homes that go into foreclosures in terms of the macroeconomic consequences. But don't get me wrong, my friends, there are losses that are going to occur. Um, and they're, they're, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be significant, but, but that's the risk around commercial real estate. But there's a lot of people who kind of forgot that it was risky. I'm afraid a lot of folks. So this is a nice segue into the next, the next conversation, which is, which is recession. And you mentioned jobs, jobs are, the market's tight right now in the driver's seat, uh, uh, workers are in the driver's seat, but depending on what happens coming up, do you see that? shifting uh, depending on where we go economically. And by the way, this is very tangential, but plugging again, hold on, let me get my uh, screen share here, plugging again also what sort of the longer term picture looks like for that jobs market, particularly as uh, what what uh, we're hearing in, in sort of economic headlines here as the baby bust economy continues to play out over time. So with all of that, let's talk about first sort of short term recession, uh, the next six months. And, and once again, we're hearing a few of a few of those pundits talk about, you know, the potential for keeping your eyes out for, for housing bust. And I'm skeptical, but I, I want to hear your thoughts on all of that. Sure. Sure. Well, you know, if you just looked at, at housing, the technical definition, as I've reminded folks over and over again, the technical definition of a recession requires activity to decline. You actually have to have declining activity, not slowing activity, declining activity. Now, there truly has been, we know it, everybody knows it, declining activity in residential real estate, declining activity in certain portions of commercial real estate, and certainly declining activity in tech and venture capital all of those being the most interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy. But when you actually broaden out and look at the U.S. economy overall, which we all know is over 60 percent driven by consumer spending, consumer spending has just simply not declined yet. It hasn't. Now, when student loan repayments start back up, you're going to see some decline in consumer spending. The question is, will it be enough? Will it be enough to actually tip the U.S. economy into an actual recession, right? So shrinking economy. And you can thread, you know, we're sort of threading to this point, that narrow needle. Um, I hate the cliche, but that soft landing needle where the Federal Reserve raises rates enough to curtail, infl curtail inflation without actually tipping the economy into an actual recession. But initial claims are off of their lows. So one of the things that we know weekly, we look at claims for in, initial claims for unemployment benefits. It comes out every single Thursday at their low. There were only 220 initial claims every week. And that was about a year ago. We've gone up to 260,000 initial claims every week. But guys, 400,000 is normal. So we're still way down in a typical recession. You'd need to see 600,000 
initial claims every week. That's typical of a recession. So we're a long way off from any of the traditional indicators flashing red. Now, I understand why everybody's worried. How does the Federal Reserve raise rates 500 basis points and not tip the economy into recession, right? It, it, it's, it, it's remarkable, right? And if they manage to do it, it will be, you know, the, the heist of the century, so to speak, right? It'll be something. Um, but, but we're right there. We're there. Um, so I'm still in the camp of I don't see the data yet that's telling me a recession is around the corner. I would need weaker consumers and I'd need bigger job losses, right? As long as consumers can still spend money, the economy goes on. It just does. Housing bubble talk. Uh, right? Or no. Pop, right? Um, how can you have a, a bubble when there's this much infant there's just the inventory is this tight? That's really it. That anyone who's lived through more than one cycle. Right. So anybody who's an agent who's over the age of, say, 40 years old and has been in this business long enough to sort of have seen a couple of housing cycles. Typically, what drives them is overbuilding, overbuilding for the current demand um, or loose credit conditions and basically loans that no one could pay back under any circumstances. How do you get a bubble when this much of the sales that are sort of are happening in cash, right? Nobody's leveraged. So essentially bubbles require leverage. You know, how did the, what what was behind the um, cryptocurrency bubble? It was leverage, right? If you didn't have any leverage, nobody gets in trouble. The bubbles come from the leverage and this is just not a leveraged situation. We're about to go into Q and A, but before we do that, let's do a little global snapshot here because um, we've got a lot of reflections right here, right now, in terms of slowing down Japan, uh, uh, Europe, all the all, all of Europe, Australia. I mean, they're all making headlines this week for some real tightening activity, and their central bank, uh, European central bank, is is kind of on the same treadmill right now. What are, what are your thoughts? What are the what are the implications for the rest of the year here? Well, remember that the U.S. started tightening rates before everybody else did. Yeah. So they've got another probably two, three months. They waited even longer to tighten rates than the U.S. did. And most of those economies that are softening are net importers of energy and food. Right. They're net importers of energy and food. The prices of both have been very high for the last 18 months. So that was going to bite eventually. One of the things about the U.S. economy is we are a net exporter of food and energy. So the negative shock from food prices and energy prices that is Europe is struggling with that. Um, parts of Asia are struggling with that. Certainly Africa struggles with that as well. All of those countries are net importers of food and energy. And that's the reason why their economies are struggling relative in the face of higher interest rates. While in the U.S., even though interest rates have gone up, money's gotten more expensive, you have massive exports of energy and massive exports of food that have supported pockets of consumers around the US. And those two industries are spread out everywhere. They're all over the place. They're not nearly as concentrated. Used to be when energy prices went up, Texas benefited and the rest of the country suffered, right? Now energy prices go up and it's spread across the country because of fracking, shale oil, all that stuff. We've got some questions coming in. Keep them coming, guys. So uh, let's let's hit these. First one, how do you convince sellers to move when they have two things making them hesitate? Number one, they're holding the 3% mortgage. Number two, they're worried they won't find a place to live. Obviously, sellers become buyers. Vicious cycle. Yes, it is an extremely vicious cycle. And my heart goes out to you. I'm going to say everyone who is on this call right now, I am guessing these are the most difficult conditions that you have ever operated under as an agent. I, I absolutely, I sympathize with you. I would not want to be in your shoes right now. It is really, really tough. And this is when the best of the best, right? Those of you who have done the work, done the training, done all the things right, this is when your real value shows up because this is when it gets really, really difficult. So, number one, the first thing you have to do is, you know, convince folks that. 
all right, great. You got that 3% interest rate. Wonderful. Fine. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But if life means that you have to move, they have to be educated on the fact that number one, there's adjustable rate mortgages. So you can do that if you want to hold that long-term interest rate and then lock in later when interest rates come down. Now, I know that all comes with a risk, right? Um, but, but, but that's just the reality. So there are alternatives. Um, we are seeing interesting things happen on the assumable mortgage side of things, right? Now, I know that's a super small sliver of the market, and that's going to be not in the luxury end of things, most likely. But that's another area where this is a time when everybody has to get super creative around how you're going to get people to actually, um, you know, move house. Right. And I, I also sympathize with if we did move, you know, if we do sell our house, where will we move? Um, and again, like I said, there are 500,000 new apartment buildings coming online right now um, to house folks for this interim period. Um, there's a building that's that sort of New York is opening very, very soon um, on the luxury side of things to address this issue. Right. Where, you know, you've sold your house. You're waiting for the next thing. And for the low, low price of $26,000 a month, you can get a three to four bedroom apartment in New York City <laughs> just as nice as the house you're going to move into. Right? So not going to be cheap, right? But there are solutions depending on you know what kind of buyer you're talking to. And I'm in plug mode today, but I'm going to do it again. For all of this, th th there were a couple of people who said, well, yeah, but 2008, 2009 was really the worst. Yes, um, especially though for those newer agents, it's, it is absolutely rough. Guys, there is so much Intel education tips, et, et cetera, coming at you during webinar week. Agents, we've got some of the best of the best experts on how to work this kind of market for you this is timed for this kind of stuff we're all going through so please again treat it like a buffet go through go through the lineup and, and pick what you think is really going to be uh the most valuable to your bottom line and don't miss mercy all right so uh next one on the list um do you feel consumers are maintaining their usual spending by utilizing their credit cards will credit card debt have an impact sure um we do know that during the pandemic credit card balances collapsed, right? And one of the things that as, as sort of we stopped going out, we stopped traveling, so about six months, people sort of under you know horrible conditions essentially really got their balance sheets in order, right? And so one of the things that's been driving the post-pandemic boom is that people had lots of money in their bank account, their credit card balances were really, really low, and so they had lots of firepower at the ready to sort of come back and revenge spend and do all that. Now, fortunately, we've seen things kind of go back to normal when it comes to credit card balances. And so the thing to do right now is don't look at the increase in debt levels year over year, because it's not a good comparison. Like you said, Jess, 2019 is the normal year. That's the baseline year. And when I look at credit card balances compared to 2019, they're basically back where they were back then. That wasn't a stressed consumer. It was just a normal consumer. And so I don't think that, that that's going to impair the economy going forward because people have always sort of carried a certain amount of debt. And we're just going back to that 2019 level. 2008, 2009, those were some debt levels that impaired the economy for almost a decade. That is not where we are right now.